Well good morning everyone and welcome to our service here for Sunday the 24th of January. Um, I hope you're safe and well and whether you're from Banbridge, Black School or Donald Cloney Churches or you're a visitor um, on our uh, YouTube page, you're very welcome. I hope you're keeping safe and well um, in this latest lockdown. Just by way of announcements let me uh, emphasise the um, Announcement from our Methodist Church hierarchy um, on Friday uh, this week that due to the extension of the current lockdown uh, by the Northern Ireland Executive until the 5th of March, um, all our services have been directed, all our churches have been directed to remain closed for Sunday services um, until then. Um, there we appreciate that uh, many will be saddened and disappointed by that but we hope you understand that uh, obviously in light of the numbers at the moment it's totally the correct decision. The online service here and uh, our telephone service for our elderly folks will continue Sunday by Sunday um, until that point and we'll keep you updated um, on what's happening after that. And also just to let you know as well about our Bible study on Zoom on a Wednesday evening uh, at 8 o'clock. Um, it's not too late to join us. We're only on the third week of our study by uh, Max Licato called Unshakable Hope. Um, so you're not too late to join. You haven't missed too much there. If you'd like to join that, uh, contact me via the WhatsApp group or um, the ma telephone at the manse and I'll get you connected on and you'll be, uh, you'll be very welcome and you'll enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a lovely study, a very good study. Let me read for you as we begin our service from Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. They say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We put our faith and our trust in God Almighty this morning once more. We're going to join together in our opening hymn, uh, a great hymn of faith. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
continue together in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We acknowledge that you are God, our Father in heaven this morning. We thank you that you do not change. Your compassions, they do not fail. And Lord, you have been there from the beginning of time and you will always be there. Father God, we acknowledge that you have been with us. You have been with us since last March. You have been with us in each lockdown, in each good time, and each bad time in our lives. Thank you that you are a faithful God. We thank you for the new mercies that we do indeed see morning by morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided everything that we have ever needed. We thank you, Lord, for the changing seasons, the summer, the winter, the springtime and the harvest. We see your hand in it all. We thank you, Lord, for your creation, for green fields, hills, mountains, valleys, rivers, lakes, seas that we can see all around us in this country. We acknowledge the changing seasons and know that we are in many ways in the depths of winter, but that spring will come, followed by summer. Lord, we thank you for your mercies to us, your blessings to us day by day. Lord, most of all, we want to thank you for the gift of Jesus, for sending him to die on the cross for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, for the period of Lent, which is coming up quite soon, for that time of reflection, to think about the journey that Jesus went on all those years ago, which led to Jerusalem and to the cross on Good Friday and ultimately the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings and encouragements to us, for our church family, for our own families, for our friends, for all that you have blessed us with. Father God, we also acknowledge that we let you down by our thoughts, our words and our deeds. We thank you for that pardon for sin that we thought about in our last hymn. We thank you and we praise you, God, for your forgiveness for our sins. We confess those wrong words, those wrong actions and wrong thoughts. And Lord, we thank you for the assurance of your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, for strength today, for bright hope for tomorrow, and Lord, for more and more blessings from you. Bless this service today and all that we will do. And we sum up these prayers, God, as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his followers, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now many of you will know that our Methodist Youth and Children's Department have um, a team on mission each year, Tom team, the team on mission. They've been uh, with us on the circuit here in the past and this year is no different, although it is a bit different. Obviously they can't come out um, to churches um, in the same way that they have been, but they're still there. Uh, Rebecca, uh, Lauren and Adam um, are working in Belfast filming and recording things. And so this morning, and particularly for our younger viewers, Rebecca is going to do a little prayer activity uh, with our younger viewers so enjoy that and after Rebecca we're going to join together and sing in a lovely hymn uh, a lovely new chorus my Jesus my Saviour Lord there is none like you hey everyone today I'm going to be chatting to you about fellowship and a really fun prayer activity that you can do at home with your family but first I want us to think what is fellowship? What does it actually mean? Fellowship means looking out for other Christians and people, encouraging each other to learn more about God. 
Fellowship can happen in your Sunday school if people help or encourage each other as you learn more about Jesus. An example of fellowship would be your Sunday school. So today we're going to be using our paper people prayer chain to help us to pray for fellowship. So if you haven't already seen our craft video by Lauren, um, you can grab a piece of paper and some colouring pencils now. It'll look a bit like this, except I'm sure yours will be much more decorative and nice than mine. So I want you to think of the people that are part of your Sunday school group, the people and friends that you are in fellowship with. This could be your leaders as well. Once you've thought of a few names, write them onto different people on your prayer chain, or you can draw them on your piece of paper now. So using this, I want to challenge you guys to pray for the people on this chain. So on Monday, you could pray for Ethan, and on Tuesday, you could pray for Lily. Use this chain to help you decide who you can pray for each day. At the minute, a few examples of things you could pray for in fellowship would be praying for someone to not feel so sad or lonely because you can't meet up in person at the minute. Praying for someone who's having a tough time because they are sick or someone in their family is. Praying for someone whose parent is a key worker, is really busy um, and they're maybe a bit worried about going out and about at the minute. Praying for someone who just seems a bit sad and needs something to help cheer them up a bit. I hope this is a helpful video for you all and I'm really excited to see you guys um, using your prayer chains to pray for fellowship with other people. I'm just going to close in prayer now. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for fellowship, for Sunday school groups, for friendship. Um, I pray that even though we're not able to meet up in person, we can still have really great fellowship with each other as we learn more about you. Um, online. Amen.
good morning. Uh, our reading today is the, the chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 2, and it's the whole chapter. So starting at verse 1. Uh, this is about Rahab and the spies. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken up to the roof. Sorry, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies and on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up onto the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to, to Shihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed. Because of, of you, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given 
the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. We finish at the end of chapter 2 and we pray that God blesses that reading of his word this morning. And let's pray together. Father, as we turn to your word, will you draw close to us by your Holy Spirit? We thank you for your uh, eternal and enduring word. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A number of years ago, there was an alcoholic who was miraculously converted at a city mission. Prior to his conversion, Joe had gained the reputation of simply being a dirty old wino for whom there was no hope, only a miserable existence in the gutter. But following his conversion to a new life in God, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person that anyone associated with the mission had ever known. Joe spent his days and nights hanging out at the mission doing whatever needed to be done. There was never any task that was too lowly for Joe to take on. There was never anything that he was asked to do that he considered beneath him. Whether it was cleaning up the vomit left by some violently sick alcoholic or scrubbing the toilets down after careless men had left the bathroom filthy, Joe did what was asked with a soft smile on his face and with a seeming gratitude for the chance to help. He could be counted on to feed the feeble men who wandered into the mission off the street and to undress and tuck in the bed men who were too out of it to take care of themselves. <clears throat> One evening, the director of the mission was delivering his evening evangelistic message to the usual crowd of still and sullen men with drooped heads, there was one man who looked up, came down the aisle to the altar and knelt down to pray. He cried out to God to help him to change. The repentant drunk kept shouting, Oh God, please make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. The director of the mission came over and knelt down beside him and said to the man, Son, I think it would be better if you prayed, make me like Jesus. The man looked up at the director with a quizzical expression on his face and asked the simple question, Why, is he like Joe? Is he like Joe? I'm sure we can all think of people who simply radiate Jesus. Wherever they go, they radiate Jesus' love, care and compassion. Picture them in your mind just now. The people, they might be people you know, they might be a loved one, a family member, people from history or even someone from the Bible. Now as we have seen over the past two weeks, Joshua was readying the people of Israel to enter and live in the promised land. They were nearly there now, but in chapter 2, which Andrew read for us, there was still one last job to do, which led them to Rahab's house and led to her and her family being spared and saved. In Hebrews 11, in the New Testament, we read of the great hall of faith. The great list of people down through the years. There's only two women mentioned in that. Sarah, Abraham's wife, and Rahab. Now Sarah was a godly woman, the mother of Isaac and the whole Hebrew race. And Rahab, on the other hand, was an ungodly Gentile who worshipped pagan gods and sold her body for money. Two more contrasting people you probably couldn't meet. But as Warren Wearsby contends, they both shared the most important thing in life. They both had saving faith in the true and living God. They both had saving faith in the true and living God. So what lessons can this passage teach us about faith, about trust and God's saving grace for all? Well, the first thing for me in this narrative is the element of suspense. A must-have for all good thrillers. Hopefully you were sitting even on the edge of your sofa when Andrew was reading that for us. 
Joshua secretly sent the two spies in the Canaan with a special instruction to stake out the city of Jericho. Now Joshua, the military commander, wisely realised that if the Israelite people wanted to settle in the promised land, then the key strategic places was always going to be the cities. So he sent the two spies to do what spies do best, spy. So they went to this city of Jericho and there they found Rahab's house and so they stayed there. Now, we know that Rahab was a prostitute. So countless biblical commentators over the years have speculated on why those two spies decided to enter that particular house. Well, one Bible commentary gives three very good reasons why. I think they're very good reasons. Firstly, a house of ill repute was a good place to gather information. If they were going to need some information, that's the place to get it. Secondly, because it was a house of ill repute, it was situated in the city's walls. So it was a good place to be if the spies needed to escape very quickly, if they needed to make a quick getaway. And thirdly, perhaps God... God's hand was in this. He directed the spies to Rahab's house because he knew that her heart was open to him and that she was going to be instrumental in the battle of Jericho, the Israelite victory. Both Hebrews 11 and James 2.25 seem to indicate that Rahab had put her faith in God before the spies had even arrived. She had put her faith and trust in him and turned away from the other false gods the people in Jericho worshipped. One Bible commentary declares Rahab didn't allow her past to keep her from the new role God had for her. Rahab didn't allow her past to keep her from the new role that God had for her. And perhaps that's a question for us this morning. How often have we allowed our past to hold us back from a new role that God might have for us? So the narrative moves on. And before long, rumours reach the king of Jericho that spies are in his city and are actually in Rahab's house. So he commands Rahab to bring these men to him. In verses 4 to 7, we learn that Rahab has hidden the men, but then tells the king that they have been in her house, but at dusk they left before the city gates had been closed. Very cleverly, she adds, go after them quickly. You might catch up with them. And so the king's men go out after them into the night. Now this is where it gets very interesting in this passage. Rahab lied to the king. So the question for us to consider is, is it okay to lie at times? Now we know that the ninth commandment famously is, do not lie. So how can we reconcile those two things? Well, it seems that again, biblical commentators offer three different explanations. Firstly, Rahab was simply deceiving the enemy which was a normal practice in any wartime situation. Secondly, because Rahab was not a Jew, she, wasn't, she didn't need to be held responsible for keeping God's law. And finally, thirdly, Rahab broke a lesser principle. She broke a lesser principle, which was telling the truth to uphold a higher principle, which was the protection of God's people. Someone has famously said, God uses the most unlikely of people, the most broken of men and women, for his glory and to advance his purposes. God can use a fallen woman. God can use an old drunk. And God can use you and me for his glory and purpose. So in verses 8 to 11, Rahab goes up to where the spies are hidden and basically tells them that she knows that God has and will give them this land. Even in Jericho, they've heard of the Red Sea incident. They've heard the battles that the Israelites fought and won in the desert. 
She declares that the Hebrew God, the Lord Almighty, is the one true God and there is nothing that they can do to stop his will from being done. Verses 12 and 13 are probably the key verses in the whole chapter. Rahab says, Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to me and that you will save us from death. Now interestingly, Rahab isn't interested in herself. She's only interested in her family. She wanted them saved and spared. Now a very human reaction you might say but Rahab knows what will happen when Israel attacks Jericho. She knows the carnage there will be and pleads with the spies for the lives of her family as anyone would do in the same situation. I'm reminded of the illustration of the chickens. Whoever invented the word chicken hearted didn't know his chickens. I have never seen a greater demonstration of courage, fearlessness and loyalty than I have seen displayed by a chicken in a time of danger. A hen will sit immovable through even the most violent storm with her chicks gathered in safely beneath her that they might be protected from the elements. This explanation can help us better understand Rahab's determination to protect her family at all costs from the coming battle. Our lives, for your lives, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us this land, the spies tell her. Now here the spies and Rahab make a covenant that she and her family will be spared if they simply keep quiet. Rahab, we know, lets the spies down by a rope in verse 15 and gives them a last piece of advice. Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way. Hide yourselves away until it is safe and then go back to your camp. I have no doubt the spies are very, very grateful. Put yourself in their position for a moment. They have been in great, imminent, life-threatening danger. And then this woman, who they didn't know had saved them, she had risked her life, her own life, for them. So the men in verses 17 to 20 promise her that they've made a binding oath, a covenant. Because Rahab's house is in the city walls and has a window therefore, if she lets down a scarlet cord from this window, everyone in that house will be saved and spared. If anyone goes outside into the street, then they will be killed. And many Bible commentaries link this scarlet cord that Rahab let down from her window to the painting of the blood on the Israelite doors during the first Passover when God killed all the firstborn boys in Exodus 11. The similarities are very, very noteworthy. So in verse 21, Rahab agrees and affirms, let it be as you say. The spies go and hide in the hill for three days and when their pursuers had come back to Jericho, the spies made their way back across the Jordan River and reported to Joshua everything that had happened. That had happened. Now imagine Joshua's reaction when these two spies declare in verse 24, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. The people are melting in fear because of us. The Israelites knew God Almighty was with them. Rahab knew God was with them. Now was coming the time to enter the land and seize and settle into it. Now one more interesting fact about Rahab. In Matthew 1, Rahab is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, one of only a small number of women mentioned. 
in the list of Jesus' descendants and ancestors. Abraham's mentioned, Jacob, David, Solomon, and Rahab the prostitute who saved the spies and was spared by the Israelites because of her faith and trust in God. Rahab, one Bible commentary finishes with, Rahab is indeed the living embodiment of Romans 5.20, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. A friend of mine told me a while back that he had seen a plumber's van passing him with the advertisement on its side. There is no place too deep, too dark or too dirty for us to handle. There's no place too deep, too dark or too dirty for us to handle. Now what a great explanation of God's love and grace for us. <clears throat> Whether that's an old alcoholic at a mission, a fallen pagan woman, or you and me, God's love and grace are open for us always. There's a beautiful lyric in a new song by Hill Songs called What a Beautiful Name, which says, My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? Beautiful words. Believe them today and trust God with your life once more. Just like the spies. Just like Joshua. Just like Rahab. And remember when we do this, God's love radiates from us. So that others see the difference in our lives. Amen. Reverend Ken Bradley is going to lead us now in our prayers for others. We join together in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we bring to you your world. You created it perfect, but the first humans sinned, resulting in evil mixed with good ever since. We ask that by your power you hear the prayers that we offer today and answer, the, answer them in your time. God of wisdom, we thank you for the peaceful inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris in the United States of America. And we pray for wisdom and guidance for their administration. God of peace, we pray for every nation across your world, torn by strife, division and conflict. Raise up leaders who will strive for reconciliation, unity and justice, and give them many supporters to follow their lead. God of knowledge, we thank you for all who have been working hard to provide vaccines against coronavirus. Hasten its production and distribution, not only in this country, but also and especially in poorer nations. God of healing, we pray your healing for all currently suffering from COVID. Give your strength to all doctors and nurses on the front line as they administer treatments to help their patients. Enable all health workers to cope with the physical, mental and emotional stress involved. God of hope, we ask you to give help and hope to the hundreds of red flag patients whose surgery has been postponed indefinitely because of the pandemic. Help them not to despair, but to trust that consultations and surgery will be offered to them soon. God of comfort, we pray for your loving arms to surround all who have been bereaved in the past year especially, whatever their circumstances. May they know your presence and peace with them at all times 
as they come to terms with their loss. Ever-present God, in this time of extended lockdown, may the lonely and isolated feel your nearness with them. Provide good Samaritans who will keep in touch with them often by telephone or social media, and may all their needs be catered for. God of continuing creation, we praise you for the ways that have been found to spread the gospel throughout your world. For the written word, the spoken word, by radio, television and social media. Thank you for the technology we have to offer services online, as well as fellowship times on Zoom. Guide and provide for your church in this ongoing and developing work and all our prayers we offer in the precious and worthy name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. For our final hymn this morning, we're going to sing um, a personal favourite of mine, a lovely new chorus that I know many of us love, Faithful One, So Unchanging. And I simply love the words in the chorus in this little chorus, you are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. <laughs> So 
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Have a good week, folks, and be blessed.